Hello and welcome to the Resilient Sessions podcast. My name is Alice Driver and I'm delighted to welcome Johnny Benjamin and Stuart Harris. Hello. 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 Thanks you both for being here today. Now, the Resilient Sessions podcast was born out of a conversation between myself and Cy Harmer, who's a military veteran, and he was injured in 2009. He told me that when he was in hospital recovering, the days were really busy with people coming and going, but it was the nights that were really hard as they were so quiet. He wanted to be able to pop in his headphones and just listen to something that would give him a slither of hope and be part of a positive conversation. So the podcast's aim is to create meaningful, inspiring conversations between two unlikely individuals who come together to talk about their experiences, careers, challenges and how they've handled resilience in their own lives to act as an inspiration to those listening. Thank you to you both for being here today. Absolutely. Thanks very much. Now, we always start the podcast with each guest introducing each other. Johnny, would you like to introduce us to Stuart, please? Yes. Yeah, with pleasure. Uh, This is Stuart Harris. Stuart Harris left school at 16 to join the army and serve with 1st Battalion, the Welsh Guards. Whilst on tour in Afghanistan in 2012, a roadside bomb hurled Stuart's vehicle into a ditch, leaving him with brain damage, the impact of which has left him partially sighted and partially deaf. The same year, he also witnessed three of his comrades shot dead by an Afghan policeman. Stuart was later diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder before leaving the army at the age of 30. Shortly after his return to civilian life, and whilst coming to terms with his diagnosis, a burglary took place at Stuart's home, which he shares with his wife and two young daughters. The family's car and household items were stolen, as well as Stuart's glasses, upon which he has relied heavily since sustaining his injuries. The impact of the burglary meant that Stuart was too afraid to leave his house. His sleeping was affected and he became too afraid to take his prescribed medications for fear they would affect his alertness. Slowly, he began to return to the dark, early days of his diagnosis. However, with support from ABF, the soldier's charity, and involvement with Blesma programmes, Stuart began the journey to recovery. Today, Stuart works full-time as a briefing liaison officer for the soldier's charity. He is also a regular speaker for Making Generation R, where he has shared his story in a variety of settings. He continues to seek adventure, climbing Mount Kilimanjaro and completing the Three Peaks Challenge. And he is active in his local community, including introducing a scheme of free swimming sessions for veterans at five council-owned pools. Thank you. I didn't know you did that. That's pretty yeah, impressive. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I know. I don't even swim. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I just thought it was something for him to do. Very nice cool. for their families, you know, on the weekend. Absolutely. Thanks, Johnny. And Stuart, will you introduce cool. Johnny to us? Yeah, I'd love to. Johnny Benjamin is an award-winning mental health campaigner, film producer, public speaker, writer and vlogger from London. At the age of 20, while he was a student at university, Johnny was diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder, a combination of schizophrenia and bipolar. It was while hospitalised as a result of this condition that he ran away from the hospital and found himself on Waterloo Bridge with the intention of ending his life. But a stranger came to his side, listened to him carefully and helped guide him to safety. Over the years, Johnny began making films on YouTube about his condition that have since been watched by hundreds of thousands of people. He became a campaigner for mental health and suicide prevention and has worked to break down the shame and stigma that can surround the subject. In 2014, Johnny launched a nationwide campaign with Rethink Mental Illness to help find the man that came to his aid on the bridge that day. And soon he found Neil. The two of them are now firm friends, have worked intensively together on campaigns and both ran the London Marathon in 2017. Johnny now speaks publicly about living with mental illness and has written articles and given various interviews on TV, radio and in the print around the world to help educate and break stigma. His book, The Stranger on the Bridge, was released last year. In the Queen's 2017 New Year's Honours list, Johnny was awarded the MBE for his services to mental health and suicide prevention. Thank you, Stuart. very good. I feel I'm amongst really good company today. So, yeah, how are you both today on this sunny day? Nice little walk around London. Good. A little bit of talking in between. Very nice. Do you, uh, do you like London? 
Oh, I love London, yeah. yeah. I love London, yeah. I don't know if I could live here, but... I, I, yeah. I, I can I live here, but I, I, <laughs> yeah. I don't know how I do it sometimes. It's just it's so intense. It's, it can be really intense and really overwhelming in there. Yeah, I need to get out. I need to get out sometimes. Yeah, it depends as well, because you don't get spoken to a lot either sort of thing. So it is nice to be on your own, just get your... Your yeah, headphones yeah. on, just walk around. Yeah. Have a little thing. But there's so much to see and do, isn't there? You know, like I, I ended up taking a picture of the marble arch when I got the <laughs> shoe. Like, I'm never going to look at it again, but I just, I've got to take a picture. But, uh, yeah. London. Memories yeah. of London. Yeah. Well, Stu, I'd like to start with you, if that's okay. Um, you're a veteran and you had a fantastic career in the army and you travelled all over the world. Yeah, yeah. But it was when you went out to Afghanistan that things changed for you, really. Because there was two incidents in particular that I'd like to talk to you about. Would you be able to share what happened? Of course. So the first one was on July 1st, 2012. We left our compound with a team of eight, which was a bit less than what you normally travel out with, but guys were away on R&R and stuff like that. So uh, we, we had a small team of eight. We went to uh, this compound that's about 40 minutes away and we uh, we left a vehicle outside and another vehicle went inside. I was given cover watch on the, in the vehicle outside with three men and the, four, uh, another, the other vehicle with the four men were inside. And then out of nowhere, I just remember hearing gunfire and I remember looking outwards, you know, where the hell is that coming from? And then the guy, Mark, on top cover was like, it's coming from inside, we need to get in there. And presumably, did you, you thought that inside was safe? Or? Yeah, well, at this point, I thought the enemy were inside. Okay. So it had to get inside. So I drove the vehicle through the compound wall. It's like a Mastiff 22 tons, so it's not like driving your Mini into a wall. You know, so, <laughs> But I, I do remember... As I was getting nearer and nearer the wall and accelerating to get speed to smash through this wall, you know, the, the walls are huge, like 20 foot, you know, really, really thick. And I remember as I got, you know, tense in my whole body, and we just went through, smashed through it. Anyway, I spun the vehicle round and we got out and then we couldn't get over to a certain part of this compound. So I went out of a gate and by this point, when I got to the men, one of them was in another doorway and it was a good mate of mine, Craig Roderick. And at first I looked at him, the thought in my mind was he was asleep. And I remember thinking, how can you sleep at a time like this? But unfortunately he was dead. Craig was the only one that I seen like that. And then I went back over to the, the vehicle that was on the outside. I'd left my vehicle at this point. And there was a Fijian young lad called Pete Tui Savora. And he'd been shot in the head, but I didn't know he'd been shot at the head at this point. I remember him having loads of bandages around his head, but I, I, did, I didn't really didn't know. I was trying to do like first aid on him. And then the medic was next to me. He was like, I don't know whether I was in shock or anything, but this first aider was encouraging me to do the first aid on him, okay. maybe to keep me busy or something. I don't know. And then I seen Jack Richardson. I can still see him now all very red faced and that lot and he Jack was 18 years old and Craig Roderick and him were like brothers so I just remember going up to Richardson then and saying look over there I'm sure I've seen any me over there I didn't see anyone over there I just needed to give him something to do and was there still gunfire or There's, yeah and it's okay. coming over everywhere so it was a planned attack uh, from the Taliban it was a Taliban soldier dressed as a policeman uh, what had happened before they'd gone in there he was the only one there but we all assumed, yeah, that's fine. They must be doing their job, going out on patrols and everything. So the guys were like, right, this is done. We'll pack up and leave. And it's when they left, they got channeled into sort of a corridor and the policemen opened fire with a machine gun. So, you know, they were all murdered. So three of them died straight away. And John Scarlett, who was at the front, got shot, I think, through the leg. And so to just going back there again, so you're... Being a medic, essentially. Yeah, yeah, with with young with Tui. Your colleague. And then as I worked up his body, I felt his head. And do you remember when we were kids and you make a papa mache balloon? Yeah. And then sometimes it caves in or whatever. It, it, that's what the feeling oh I got. Oh, God. And I felt like such a fool for doing all this first aid, thinking I could bring this guy back to life when clearly oh. there was no chance of it. I was told to turn my attention to John. And a, a chopper eventually came and a chopper took forever to come because it was such a hot zone. So we got attacked from everywhere. 
there was only four of us alive and they send radio signals to everyone. The Afghans are so, they're great at using what, what tools they have. Agile, tenants, yeah, yeah, don't yeah. They're, they're, yeah, they're brilliant. And they picked up on the weakness. So they attacked us from every single angle. And I remember at one point opening the door of the vehicle and just, you know, ding, ding, ding off the side of the door. And, you know, that's inches away from being in my face. And anyway, if you get shot in the face, that's, that's you done. Yeah. Anyway, I remember getting in there and I remember just sat there for like a second. And I was like, oh my God, this, this is it. I am not going to see my kids again. This is where I die. So I got the vehicle started. John got put on the back. So I drove through, as you know, through the wall. Yeah. And Chow was my section commander, brilliant leader. But I felt compelled to tell him that I might have damaged the vehicle. Because, <laughs> <You know? laughs> like, you forget at this point, like, no one gives a shit. Yeah. If it was a normal instance and you trashed a vehicle, you, you, people are going to lose they're their... Gonna they're going to be consequences. Yeah. yeah, but there's not going to be any consequences here. But I still, like, was in the mode of... I was like, Chow, I, I had to drive it through. I've scraped the sides, <laughs> you know, sort of thing. So anyway, I drove about 250 metres up this road where a helicopter could land. I remember taking John on the chopper and I remember cutting his lanyard to his pistol because you're not allowed to go back to Bastion with any ammunition or right. w weapons. So I cut his pistol off, and then I'm walking around like John Wayne then with two pistols. <laughs> and I'm like, so I'm like, oh, put my pistol away. I'm like, oh, I don't know what to do this one. I'm putting it down my pants. Like, I'm like, please don't go off. <laughs> you know, it's, it's ironic, because later on I lose my testicles, so I could have lost everything. <laughs> so, but you, so, don't, yeah. you didn't get on that chopper, did you? No, no, but no, no. You, no. Did, and you stayed in yeah, Afghanistan? Yeah, yeah, me, Chow, Eds, and Craig, and Everett, we went back to camp then. We got taken into an ops room and that's where we were told, you know, Pez, Rodders and Tui had all been confirmed dead on arrival at Camp Bastion. I remember um, some of the lads, you know, just crying their eyes out. I, I was about to tell them, you know, stop crying. But Chal put his hand on my chest and said, no, leave, leave him, leave him. Which was definitely the right thing yeah, to do. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. I look back now and I'm a bit embarrassed about to tell them not to cry. You know, who am I to tell them that? But that, that was your own way of coping as well, wasn't I it? I think so, so, you know. How do you get your head around that? How do you go back to your day job? I was one of the lucky ones because I was about to go on R&R &R a week later. But Chow was like, let's just get you home. Everyone came back to Bastion for a day. And Bastion's like super safe. It's a little town, no theft, no crime. You know, I take my kids there on holiday, you know. So, uh, <laughs> well, it's of, it's super safe. It's okay. super safe. We all went back there and got rid of our weapons and stuff. And we were there for a day and talking to everyone. Then the repatriation happened where I had the honour of carrying Craig onto a plane. And then I was getting on a plane myself back to Britain. Got back to my wife, but it was massively different, you know. I, I, and as soon as I got home, I just wanted to be back there. Because okay. I was like worried about them and what they were going through. And I, and I suppose home. you also knew you had to go back yeah. as well. It was so. my daughter's first birthday, but it ended up being on the same day as Craig's funeral back home. So I had to go to Craig's funeral. I couldn't wait for the two weeks to be over to get back. I was very different. I remember going on holiday with the kids to Blackpool and the wife, and I remember her putting the children in a separate room to me at one point. But I don't know whether that was the beginning of my issues or whatever. But And then went back out there. And the trust that we built up for so long with the Afghan police was just gone. We didn't trust them. They didn't trust us. And on September 6th, they led us down an alley and there was a remote control IED, which means basically it was an ambush. They knew what was going to go on, how it was going to happen. And the Afghan police led us down that alley to blow us up. And it did. Luckily, the vehicle we were in, a Mastiff, a new vehicle that no one died. I remember being told that we were stuck in there for hours for the engineers to come and clear all the way up to us sort of thing but what I remember personally is just the mud and darkness and uh, the next thing I know was Birmingham. For those who want to hear more about your story they can listen to your mini-sode but tell us about that conversation you had with your doctor when you first woke up. Yeah so I remember coming round and the light was a little bit like this one in here very bright. I felt like I had water on my eyes you know, like a shower and you, you rub the window and you can't quite 
see things through it clearly. You can just make out images. I remember seeing like that and he explained where I was, who was there. He explained that you have five lobes in your brain and you, he said that you've damaged the frontal, the temporal and the optical lobe, which has caused blindness and from the blast quite heavily death. And also my legs clapped together and crushed one of my testicles and the other one came out to my stomach. He explained that you won't be able to have any more children or anything okay. like that. At the time, I was like, oh, no, but then I spent a bit of time with my girls and I thought, no, I don't want any more of you. <laughs> so I'm, I'm happy with the two girls I've got. The sight thing wasn't too bad. You know, I had like the steroid program. The right eye, nothing's happened. It's not worse or it's not better. But the left eye got really a lot better. I had like this hard lens made and then I wear glasses when I'm driving. Yeah, so I can drive, so I should warn you off, okay. <laughs> Every, everyone. Stay when, I went to, yeah, when I went to Headley Court, uh, redid my driving licence. I don't know if the guy was on the side and goes, yeah, just put him through. He's been, he's been through enough. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry about the general yeah, public. Yeah, just been fine. putting through, guys. Uh, but yeah. So, Stu, would you be able to tell us about the time when you really hit rock bottom? Yeah, so um, I, I was just struggling with, you know, day-to-day -day tasks and it, it built and it snowballed and that. It just went from bad to worse. Uh, um, I would get frustrated with people cycling on the road, and uh, I suppose people can get angry with that, but not to the point where you get out of your car and pull them off and put them on the cycle path physically. <laughs> so I was getting in trouble with the police, and I was, I was very short with my children and my wife, and it just grew and grew and grew, and it's this just black abyss that I was living in and to the point where I, the answer for me was to not be there anymore. I didn't feel I was bringing anything to the party and I went down to my, my, where I live in, in North Wales, went to the beach and I just took my shoes and socks off and I went into the water and I can still, you know, feel the water around my feet. I just thought if I just swim out there until I haven't got the energy to swim back and I just started doing the front crawl out there and waves smashed me in the face and just out of nowhere I just had a vision of my two girls getting bullied at school and I just couldn't go through with it so I remember going back home you know sopping wet and I told the wife what I was about to do which was extremely difficult uh, probably the most difficult thing I've ever had to do and um, she called 999 and I was placed in a mental health unit and I'd, I would never have thought about doing that no she's amazing and I often ask myself, you know, why is she with me sort of thing. I suppose everyone that meets us asks that question. <laughs> but, um, I've thought but, uh, the same. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. She's golden. She's, not, said, she's my best mate. And she, she always knows the solution to everything, like yeah. all women, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> Never wrong. But, yeah. Wow. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. Can I, can I ask you, mate? Like, because I was with you when you were just going through everything. I was there with you, like... How do you talk about it? I mean, is there kind of like a separation now or do you still go back there in yourself, in your head when you're t talking about Sometimes it? Sometimes it's a tiny bit of therapy, you know, yeah. saying it, the more I do it, the more I'm all right with it or accepting of it, you know. Sometimes it can catch me out. Like I'll do 50 talks and then I'll do a talk and then I'll just be blubbering. Like I'm like, where's this come from? Yeah. You know, so, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, it's one of them things. It's amazing. It works for me. I'm I'm happy to talk. That's the most important thing. Some people aren't, some people are, and I'm just one of them people that are happy to talk about it. Could you talk straight away or did, did it take some time to sort oh, of... Oh, it took forever. It's, it took a long time. Alice helped me in the beginning on how actually to, you know, deliver a talk where people could sort of understand because it was very wishy-washy here, back and forth, bits and pieces, and, and Alice helped me a lot with that on how to actually, you know, deliver it and to a point where people would appreciate it instead of sort of critique it. You paint the picture so we can yeah. be there with you. Yeah. And I mean, Johnny, your story has been captured in, in so many different formats. I read your book on the weekend, A Stranger on the Bridge, and there was also a documentary as well. And the campaign that Stu mentioned in your biography, Find Mike, you know, seen globally by millions of people. But for those of us listening who maybe don't know about it, can you sort of tell us a bit about yourself and your condition as well? I was 20 when I was given this diagnosis of um, schizoaffective disorder. Growing up, I, I had mental health issues. I was first taken to see a, a child psychiatrist when I was like five because I was always different growing up and I would see things that wasn't there and hear things that weren't there. 
I just felt really different growing up. And then when I was a teenager, I started hearing a voice in my head and became delusional and then depressed. But I wasn't honest. I wasn't honest about what was going on because I was, I was scared. If, you know, if I was one of your friends back then or a member of your family, would I have had any idea about what was going on with you? Nah, I got so good at being able to like mask everything, you know? Wow. You're having to hide, yeah. You're constantly having to hide and, and your guards up all the time. Even when you're kind of at your worst, you need to put on this sort of act, this performance. It's really hard. It's exhausting. It's yeah, exhausting. Yeah, I was going to say that must be tiring. Yeah, to keep putting on this kind of mask and act. And especially like a university when, you know, I thought everyone was having the time of their lives and like everyone seemed happy. And I was like, I've got to, I've got to keep putting this, this act on to show that I'm happy as well. But... And making friends and all that, you know, side of it. I remember going on my, you know, to uni and just being like, I'm not, I'm not sure if I really like anyone. I've already got my friends. Yeah. It probably isn't the best attitude, but I mean. to have to be dealing with your disorder as well as making friends, that's huge amounts of pressure. Yeah. And I, looking back, I don't know how I, I really don't know how I did it. Because you did drama, didn't you? I did. So oh, I guess okay. that, that kind of, like for me, drama was like my escape because I could sort of go into be another character. Do you know what I mean? Go and inhabit someone else for a while and escape my my head but you know ultimately I had this massive breakdown and everything sort of came out I became psychotic so what does that actually mean so I thought I was being like possessed like I couldn't control what was happening to me I was I thought I was being possessed by the devil and so stuff was coming out my mouth it wasn't my words that was coming out it was like this this devil inside me and I couldn't control what I was doing and, and I what ended kind up, of things were you doing? And well, saying? I ended up on the streets screaming and shouting and I ended up in the middle of a, a dual carriageway, just completely out of control, believing I was this sort of devil. Yeah, feeling sort of possessed. And then I got taken to hospital, obviously, and that's when I got my, my diagnosis of, of schizoaffective disorder. So how old were you when you got that diagnosis? So I was 20. That's so, a yeah, long quite... time to not have a, yeah, a diagnosis yeah. isn't it Long time and not understand feel, yeah. when I was growing up in school we didn't we didn't talk about mental health so I didn't know what was going on and um the only thing that we got when I was in school they they showed us the film One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest that film is you know it's not exactly the most sort of inspiring film no, no it's not it's, it's not a like positive it right. I, I still refer to it when I talk about it is as the cuckoo's nest sometimes yeah you know because that's what people assume oh yeah like when I saw that I was like oh I'm going to end up here and I need to do whatever I can to avoid ending up here. So hence me sort of masking everything, covering it all up and yeah, not, not telling anyone what was really sort of going on. Um, I just didn't have the words, didn't have the sort of yeah. language. And um, why would you, you well, know? Yeah. You just didn't talk about it back then, you know? Yeah. It was a massive shock when I got this particular diagnosis. I knew something wasn't, wasn't obviously right in my head. Something was going on, but yeah, massive, massive shock to, to get this diagnosis and was there a, a, any relief within that or was it actually like i don't want to be sort of labeled with i don't want this or not not when i got that diagnosis because schizophrenia like it's got such a stigma attached to it yeah i think when people think of schizophrenia it's often associated with like you know violence and and you know PTSD. i was just i was exactly the same there was no relief some people assume there is going to be a relief because oh finally you got yeah. but there was i was like what so what happens now? nothing because nothing actually changes but I, d I don't know about you but see when, when I was given my diagnosis there wasn't any sort of like no one said like oh, but this is you can get through this or you can get better I don't know how it was for you they were just like look you're really ill and and you know here's here's loads of medication you go into the hospital put on suicide watch and it was really like for my for my parents as well it was there was just a lack of hope I don't know if you had this sort of like lack of hope or if, if people actually said to you, mate, you will get through this. I was a bit older than you. you. Like I know Alice said that, you know, that must be so long to 20, but I'm I'm thinking you were very young at the same time. You don't associate very young people with mental mm -hmm. health, especially something as serious as what you were going through at the time. But um, just like you, there's a load of meds. Yeah. I remember going to bed and I started to wet myself sort of yeah. thing. I was like, is this me or is this the medication making me wet? And sort of thing and uh yeah yeah very, very similar but yeah it's it well your whole world just just changes doesn't yeah. it just tips upside down and again especially like now you know mental health is being talked about yes. more it's different but you know back then it, it just it wasn't it wasn't being talked about like it is now and no. there was still that massive stigma massive, so yeah. and it was a very clinical approach to uh, 
the explanation as well. It was sort of the medical side of what was yeah. happening as opposed to just maybe asking the question, how are you? Yeah, I know. That was kind of missing. And that's why, if I'm honest, you know, I ran away from this hospital because, I don't know, there was just this... And were you were you sectioned? Did you have to be there? No, was I wasn't sectioned choice. initially. Okay. When I ran away, I got sectioned. But initially okay. I was just put in and I, I knew I had to be there. Like yeah. I was yeah. suicidal now. That's, what, that's exactly the same. Exactly. I, yeah. I had to be somewhere away. Especially like ending up on the dual carriage where I was like, I don't know what... <laughs> I kind of get scared of myself, you know? And that's a horrible place to be. So when you went on to that dual carriageway, this was your, as you've described, it's like the devil. Was yeah. that was that person taking you there? Were you... Uh, f- what, in terms of going to the dual carriageway? Yeah, or? yeah. The, the, there was absolutely, you weren't conscious of that at all. Well, or? Do, do you know what? There was a trigger. F- for me, the trigger was I had a car accident. Okay. And it was a Sunday afternoon, driving, someone reversed into me. It wasn't a major car accident, but I don't know, something in my mind just kind of snapped. And then I just couldn't think clearly. And I just started to feel just out of control, just a loss of control of, of what I was doing, of, of, yeah, what I was saying. Often there is a trigger, I think, you know. Yeah, it's really good that you know your triggers as well. Yeah, that's, that's it's half really of it, important. I think. It's really important. Yeah, it's a, little bit, it's a little bit scary. But if you know your triggers, then it's it makes, a, help, it makes yeah. a difference. Yeah. So you decided to run away from the hospital. What happened next? Well, I'd spent a month in the hospital and... Again, something in my head snapped this one night. Like, you, you were saying before, like, you've got so much time to think in the hospital and you do, your head just, wow, it's just spinning and spinning and spinning. And and, and I was like, I can't do this anymore. It's it was just unbearable, just the hospital. I, I now was getting these panic attacks every time I went outside. So I said to myself, I can't even, I can't go outside. I, I can't bear to be in the hospital anymore. There's only really one thing that I can do, and that is to end my life. And like you were saying before about your family, like for my parents, I was like, this is, I feel like an absolute burden on them, and I'm going to be a burden on them for the rest of their life. So surely the best thing for everyone is if I'm not here, it just, this is going to sound, but, you know, suddenly there was like a clarity in my head. Yeah. Because your head is so, like, as I said, spinning, 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 spinning. And finally you have this thought of, ending ending my life and I'm like okay there is a way out and so I went with it and the next morning yeah uh, I said I needed a cigarette and uh, they let me out of the hospital to have a cigarette and I ran I ran as fast as I could and yeah I went to this bridge and I had it all planned out went on to the edge of this bridge I, I wasn't on there for very long when this stranger came and stood next to me and he started talking to me that kind of changed changed everything just I don't know, there was something, this this way about him, he was just really calm and sort of composed and, and just very like open and just, it, it kind of reminds me of you actually, it's funny, like just really grounded and, and sort of sort of self-assured. Mm. Just this interaction was just, it was completely different to everything I'd had in the hospital. Mm. Obviously, you know, I feel, you know, incredibly lucky and that's why, I'd, I'd want to do the work that I do now to give something back because, you know, I had that interaction and it stopped me from... It's kind of like, again, what you were saying before. I mean, you know, when you talked about... Huh? Sorry. Do you want a water or anything? No, no, I'm good. No, it's just because when you... Because that was, you know, when you talked about going into the sea and, you know, again, I could see that in my head when you walked into the sea and you were gonna you know end it and then you had that moment where you were like um uh, I, t- I totally level with you you know it, it that i just felt like i was dragging everyone down or and like you said i had the clarity like this is the answer yeah i'll just do this and and thank god thank god i, I never and the same with you mate you know, yeah I, I, i've achieved so much and you've achieved so much you know imagine that you know life's a gift isn't it yeah it is but it's you know, to go to that, to go to that place, unless you've been there, I think you don't understand, you know, what it's like to be in that place. Because people don't understand, you know, people, oh, suicide is, you know, selfish and why would you, but you, you, you do, you just think it's the best thing for everyone, yeah. you know. But again, like with you, like, thank God you had that moment where you were like, I'm not going to, I can't do this, I can't do this. You thought of your girls, didn't you? Yeah. You know, and that's the thing with me, with this guy. Finally, there was a moment when I was like, what, you know, what, what am I doing? Kind of. 
hold on, what, what am I doing on this bridge? And, 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 you know, maybe there is another way. Yeah, there was, to be honest, if I'm completely honest, for me, it was when this guy, he said to me, he said, look, mate, like, you'll get better, you know, you'll be all right. And no one had said that to me before. God. So that for me was the moment and I stepped off the edge and yeah, but <laughs> I didn't know, but the police were waiting a bit further down the end of the bridge and uh, they jumped out and they basically, as soon as I got to the pavement, they, they grabbed me and they separated us and I was taken away and sectioned and he went the other way and... And that was it. That was our interaction, like, suddenly cut. But that humanity that just in that really, really dark place suddenly just came and found you mm. and it brought you back and, wow. Yeah, very, very, very lucky. And me and Neil, we talk about it and it's quite simple what you did, like, you know, mm. just, yeah, being human and just saying to me, you know, mate, you'll, you'll be all right. And because, you know, when you're in that place, you've lost, you've lost all the self sort of belief and and you need someone else to be like no you you can get through this you know yeah. and I, I I suppose this question I'm quite interested to ask both of you I um a friend of mine committed suicide and it's a horrible horrible thing but what would you have liked someone to have said to you whether that be a family member or a friend that could have helped you I mean for anyone listening who might have a family member and they're just in that dark place how do you get to that person uh, I don't have the definitive answer I don't think there is one but I would just say you know life is a gift but the world is better with you in it 100% and I'm not wrong on that the, the world is better with them in it and and if if they could go forward and look back, they they'll realise that. I honestly, at the time, I believed yeah. I was doing the best thing yeah. for my children, and my yeah. wife. You know, I was just dragging them down and dragging everyone with me, and I knew that you know they would be looked after financially wise. Cause, uh, what, what the things I, I'd even gone to that length and like moved money about and stuff, <laughs> so they'd be all right oh. for life, sort of thing. And I'd even gone to some like s s close friends and and some bits and pieces to the point and I was really going to do it and then uh yes but some held me back and I, and I I'm so glad I didn't so yeah. glad and and I hope that anyone is just even having them thoughts you know please just just stick with it and and know that the world is so much better with you in it because you talked before about that that instant you know going into the sea and then you told your wife didn't you and yeah. what was your what was your wife's reaction when you... It's something that I don't know whether we have to revisit that at some point. We haven't, but it must have been so... And that that was that was still probably is the hardest thing I've, I've yeah. probably had to do was... Because I didn't say goodbye. I didn't just say anything. I didn't tell her what I was going to do. Sure. I didn't tell her the plans. No. You know, and she's my best mate, you know. But yeah, it affects everyone around you, doesn't it? I mean, it really everything. does. And no one wants to see you like the, the, no. in this, this situation. That's the thing. Like Again, I did more visitors... You know, I was like, all my friends were like, you know, I'll come and see. You. I was like, no, and you know, I was embarrassed. I was yeah. really embarrassed. Yeah. Yeah. I was embarrassed about, you know, myself. You know, the state I was in, my mind. Embarrassed where I was. Embarrassed like by the hospital. Do you know what I mean? And I was just like, no, nah, I don't want people to see me like this. You know, um, your brain is like just carries on down this negative path of, I'm a burden. What are people going to think of me? And yeah, that embarrassment, that shame. My, yeah, my, my wife rang 999. They were going to send an ambulance. So I was like, there's no way no. I'm having an ambulance pull up outside. So I yeah. jumped in the car and drove to the hospital. Really? I said, oh, I'll be, I, I passed them. Really? So I'm, I'm, not, wow. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not having that. Because you were in, or worried or embarrassed. Well, like neighbours in the window. Like oh, that. what's that ambulance doing okay. outside Stuart yeah. Harris's house? You know, what's yeah. he done this time, the piss head? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How do you move forward from that? So, so I was taken in. You, you were taken yeah. in. So there's that forced going forward. So you're both. In, you both went to hospital. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I was in the in the in the cuckoo's nest, <laughs> and you, you just one step at a time. But it's a slow process. You have a lot of time and to think about what you've done in there because there's like there's nothing to do. You know, you got to take one day as it comes and and realize that the glass is half full, sort of thing, not half empty. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, I think you got to be patient. I know in myself, I just got so frustrated. Like, you know, it was just, it was like one step forward, like five steps back. And that makes it even worse when you get frustrated with yourself yeah. and you beat yourself up. You're like, yeah. I should be getting better. I shouldn't be in here. I need to get out. Yeah. I need to sort of. So there's loads of acceptance as well. You've oh, got to realise that you're, you're actually not well. Mm. 
yeah. but then you explain that to yourself and then you explain that the things that you know you've seen or felt aren't normal either so and then you accept that and mm. it's good so you start accepting that yeah i'm trying a new medication i'm trying a therapy i'm mm. trying the sport whatever works for you but you, you you need to be very accepting and you know be kind to yourself yeah, a little bit as well sure. you know it's all right you know you break your arm you get your arm in a sling it's that for six weeks everyone sees it Everyone you know, wants to sign yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everyone wants to sign it or draw a cock and balls on there. <laughs> and it's, 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 well, that's just me. But um, it's, it's just, it's, it's, you've got to be accepting and a bit kind to yourself. And What things have you used? What techniques have you used that have really helped you move forwards? Whether that's be as like a distraction or as a kind of therapy? There's, yeah, different things. Therapy for sure. It's just, I mean, the talking is the talking. For yeah. me, that's the acceptance came with yeah, the talking. Definitely. I spent all of my early 20s after that diagnosis just being like, this isn't me. I want. I need to get rid of this sort of, this illness. I need to just, I can't bear to be this person. This, this. Yeah. I just saw myself as this label. Do you know what I mean? I spent all of my early 20s just lost. I, I wouldn't take my medication. I wouldn't have therapy. I didn't want to talk about it. And it was finally in my mid-20s when I was like, I can't, what am I, what am I doing? I can't move forwards. I, you know, until I start actually talking about it, how can I move forwards? You know, I started making these videos because for me, I couldn't. I couldn't sit down with someone like I'm doing now. I couldn't look someone in the eye and say, I've got this, this is going on in my head. I've, I couldn't, I just couldn't face it. So for me, it was, it was easier making these like vlogs on YouTube, like talking to the camera and then putting them online. I just wanted to connect with someone. I think that was key for me was I felt so isolated mm. with it, you know? And so I put these videos online and I was like, yeah, I just want to, I just want someone to say, I get it. I've been there. And that's what, that's when things changed for me is when I finally started talking to people about it and, and hearing that I'm not, I'm not alone. I'm definitely not alone. And then I started finally, yeah, going for the therapy and, and going to support, support groups for me. Because, you know, people people will say things and you're like, oh, my God, I get that in my head as well. And for me, that was the thing, like, yeah, realising I, I definitely, definitely wasn't alone. And, you know, there's so many other people out there going through this. And would you say that's Stu, as well? It's the talking that oh, has helped you the most? Talk, definitely 100%. And I started doing a, a little bit of therapy, but I talk a lot about, you know, healthy outlets and stuff like that and how drinking isn't the answer because I've tried a bit of that and I, I can tell you 100% it just doesn't work and a lot of people will continue to say and a lot of people will continue to just not listen. Golf is a big one of mine. I'm not. If good anyone at, I'm not, yeah. looks at I'm not good, Stu's I'm not good. social yeah. media account, he's basically <laughs> a professional golfer. Uh, so so <laughs> I, I, all my all my problems become that little white ball and I just try to smash it as hard as I can around grass, really. But the thing with golf is, is, is like I've said it before, it's the game of golf is just 10%. There's the dodgy clothes. It's the socialising, you know, and then the, the fresh air and the exercise and the putting the world to rights at the 19th hole yeah. and stuff like that. And uh, you mentioned, like, social media now. I used all of them, you know, Twitter, yeah, yeah. You know, LinkedIn, Insta sort of thing. And so social media, I do use it, and, but I know... I know what's real and what's not. Yeah. And I'll do something later on. I'll probably have a picture of Johnny, me and Johnny. <laughs> yeah. yeah, great to meet you, Johnny, sort of thing. <laughs> but like, there's nothing wrong with that, you know, yes. and I'll put that on and let people know what we're doing and what mm. we're ch trying to achieve. But uh, social media can go the other way. And But, you know, but Johnny, how about you? Because you obviously have a, a really big following on social media. What are your thoughts around that? Uh, I think actually for me, like, I find social media increasingly difficult. Like, yeah. especially Twitter, because I just see so much sort of... Negativity. Yeah, there's so much negativity. And YouTube even, like, when I started making YouTube videos, there wasn't, and even Twitter, when I first went on Twitter, there wasn't this constant fighting, constant battling uh, with people. I think, you know, things like, well, Brexit, sorry. Yeah, uh, it's all right, you can say okay, it. Okay, well, said it. <laughs> but, you know, it's just caused so much division. It makes me really sad, actually, because social media... It's, it can be a really great so tool. So powerful. Yeah. But yeah. And you wouldn't have found <laughs> Neil yeah. this without... Is, this is the thing as well. Like, So I launched this campaign on Twitter, social media, and then, yeah, it went over to Facebook and finally Neil's wife saw it on Facebook because it was shared and shared and shared and shared. And that's how I found Neil, through through his wife. She saw this post that her friend had shared and she was like, oh my God, this is Johnny, the guy that he spoke to on the bridge. So if it wasn't for 
Facebook, I wouldn't have found. Do you know what I mean? So social media. It is really good, but I would, if you are really struggling with mental yeah. health, because yeah. you you'll remember the, the negative comments, won't you, over the good. You oh, can have a hundred yeah. great comments. Yeah, sure. Thumbs up, all get sure. well done, sure. very brave, all this sort of stuff. Yeah, that sure. one negative one, that's the one that will <laughs> yeah. stick with you, isn't it? So yeah, like true. I said, it is true. good. And I agree with you, it is good. And, but, but you have to be very careful. I think you have to be strong in dealing with those negative yeah, yeah, comments. Yeah, you, if you're Piers Morgan, you're all right and they bounce off. <laughs> yeah. They don't care. But, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're in a, be- a delicate place, yeah. I'd be a bit careful. Because yeah, you, true. reading from your book, you had some trolls yes. who said really it's nasty hard. things. It's, it's really hard, isn't it? Because you're just like, I'm doing something good here. Yes. I'm tr- I think I'm doing something good. You know, I've, I've got good intentions. And when you've got good intentions and you're, you, you know, when you get stuck getting attacked for that. Yeah. But then, you know, I now think about it and, because actually one one of these trolls did apologise a few months oh, later. Really? And he was like, look, I was in a bad place and I saw you and, and you know, you seem to be doing all right. And there was that sort of bit of jealousy. And yeah. I think it is. It's I, I feel sorry. I actually feel sorry for, for, for a lot of these sort of trolls and, because they're obviously yeah in, in dark, difficult places, and and I still get negative comments every now and then, and it really like you say if you get you could get ninety nine positive, amazing, amazing comments, but it's that one yeah. negative that that yeah. gets to you. It we, really... uh, a, a few years ago, I was really, really honoured and lucky to give the, the the first poppy that goes on launch is given to the prime minister, yeah. sort of thing, and she or he will make a donation to the poppy appeal sort of thing and so I had that honour oh. and then it got re- it got tweeted out yeah. by, by you know 10 down yeah, sort yeah. of thing and then there was this one that used a picture with the poppy dripping with blood and you know they're murderers they're this did that get to you? oh 100% but I think that's great advice that I think if you are in a in a bad place or and you're feeling a bit sad and actually just step back from from social media yeah. just give yourself a break uh, neil he's been telling me about this whole thing called jomo have you heard of jomo yeah. <laughs> jomo is like the joy of missing out because you know everyone oh jomo, jomo. Okay. so you know people have Instead like fomo. fomo do you know what i mean like when you're scrolling through instagram and you're like oh that person's doing this yeah. and this person's doing that so neil's telling me that he's now trying to practice this jomo where like he's like he's at home and he's like on a saturday night and everyone else is going out having fun and he's trying to be like oh that's great you know good for them Oh, this person's doing that. That's great. I'm happy at home. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And I quite like yeah. that concept of Jomo. Yeah. I'm gonna. Try, I'm, I need to try and practice that instead of being like, oh no, that person's doing that event and they've got all these likes and why am I not yeah. doing that? Yeah, I need yeah. to start practicing that. Lots of people we've spoken to, they've talked about having this light bulb moment where, in a, a, a challenging time, they've had a real moment of clarity and they've called it this life bulb moment of how they're going to move forward. But I don't know if either of you can relate to that. Uh, you know what? I, di- I didn't. It just, it just, like, it, it literally was just one step at a time. I was, I'd get better and then I started talking about it. I met you. <laughs> I started learning how to, yeah, started learning how to <laughs> talk about it started doing a little bit on the circuit a bit on the talking circuit and started making a couple of quid and thinking and then being able to maybe go on a little holiday with the family and then that happened and we went on holiday and we really enjoyed it and uh, i thought oh, i'll have another one of these <laughs> so <laughs> things how do i do that i get a job I did it, and i feel strong enough to do that now and before you know it you're back into society back into working normal job and getting your days leave and saving for that holiday in Tenerife, Benidorm, wherever you want to go and just enjoying the gift of life as as, as corny as it sounds. Amazing. But there was no light bulb. There was just, just get every day. How about you, Johnny? Yeah, kind of the same. There was one particular moment though I do remember where um, when I was first in hospital, they were like, you know, you, you need to get out of your head. Mm, yeah, I'll try. And they were like, you should you should give mindfulness a go. And I was always like, ah, mindfulness is not for me. I can't meditate. I can't sit there. And that's for other people. But then when I, in my mid-20s, when I finally started talking, I was like, do you know what? I'll give this. They recommended me to get this this uh, CD. It's called uh, Mindfulness for Beginners. And I was like, I'll just listen to this. And <laughs> I remember doing my first ever like like meditation. And it was just like a, t- a simple 10 minutes sort of sitting there, you know, meditation. And I'll never forget, like, after I did that meditation, I actually, I went to the sink and I just was washing my hands and I was like, whoa, there's like, there's, there's nothing in my head. Like there's, there's, all I heard was like the birds tweeting outside and the water running from the tap. And I was like, 
this is amazing. I can finally achieve some like peace of mind. That was a light bulb moment because I, yeah, I have relapses and I, I've been in hospital quite a few times and I'm all, now I know I can always find, I can always find peace of mind, you know, even when I'm in the sort of depths of despair, I know that if I just do a, a meditation exercise, you know, return to my breathing, go for a walk and, and make sure all my senses are kind of really switched on and I can achieve that peace of mind again. And to know you can find some clarity, some peace of mind, I think even when you're, you're, yeah, really at rock bottom, just for me, I know that I can always go on now. And what an amazing skill to have. I mean, that's a gift, isn't it? Knowing yeah. that you can always find peace. So many people have spoken to me about it. And I've, really? I've been a bit like you were. It's sort of, ah, yeah. not for me. Maybe you can help me, me yeah, try that or something. Definitely. Because some people say to me, like, I can't, I can't sit down. Yeah. I can't do the 10 minutes because my head's just right. spinning round and round and round. And, and what's the point? But actually, that is the point. Because mindfulness is all about the being kind to yourself and the non, yeah. non-judgment. Every time your mind is going and going, that's fine. You just yeah. keep bringing it back to the breath. But that's okay. It's the non-judgment and it's the fact that you did it. You took that time out for yourself. Yeah. I think that is key because uh, that self-care, I think, you know, is so important. So what does resilience mean to you if you had to sum it up in a in a sentence? Who's going to go first? <laughs> Everyone's like, go um, I, I don't know, like a... I'd love to give like a sexy answer or something. <laughs> it's, it's, I, I, just, just give uh, an answer. I, I, it doesn't I, I, matter. I, I think it is just, I think it's the sort of the, the, the strength and will to to carry on uh, w- against all odds sort of thing. And I think I'm resilient now. I think I needed some help and there's nothing wrong with that either. Mm. I think now, look, if someone's to say, are you resilient? I could confidently say yes. And resilience to me, I suppose, I, I would say the strength to carry on brilliant thank you johnny do you have anything yeah no absolutely the strength i think you know for me as an example like last night i um had a like a bit of insomnia just really really bad night's sleep and i was like i felt horrendous actually last night but then i woke up this morning and i was like new day new dawn and the sun pulled my blinds up sun was shining and i felt really excited about today i feel really lucky because Honestly, in my teens, especially with the depression, I was not, I was like, I'm never going to be happy. And, and every day was a, such a struggle. And I was like, how am I ever going to find that resilience? I guess I, ca- I can't do it. I'm never going to be that person that is able to just do what I did this very day. So you can change. I think that's really key. I feel really lucky that I can get up like today and be like, new dawn, new day, get on with it, feel strong. But I wasn't like that. I definitely wasn't like that in my late teens, early 20s. So you can learn it. You can learn resilience. And again, I think the mindfulness, the the therapy, the talking, you know, and learning from other people, actually. Mm. Again, like sitting here listening to you today, like in my late teens, early 20s, I was closed. I was close to it. You know, if, if, if we'd have been sitting here today and I was listening to you, I would have been inspired, but I wouldn't have, I don't know. I, I would have sort of thought that you, you know, you're, so much more like kind of superior to me and I can't <laughs> no seriously and I can't ever get to that place where I'm resilient like you but now I'm like no I can take yeah, you can. that on and I can learn from that do you know what I mean I think it's that open mindedness I yeah. think that's so key but you can learn it yeah and having faith in yourself and you are an equal and exactly that's so important yeah absolutely so important. Yeah. Well, thank you both for coming along today. Uh, my final question, how have you found our conversation and, and what are you going to take away from meeting each other? Takeaways. <laughs> <laughs> I hate that. It's so Come London, London corporate. <laughs> takeaways for today. <laughs> Thank um, you. That was just a really point. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I think I'll be taking away, you know, all Johnny's sort of tips and and how he's dealt with things, and and I assume maybe you'll take maybe, maybe <laughs> one, one or two of mine. It, this has been a really good experience. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks everyone in the room. But yeah, I'll be I'll be, I'll be definitely taking away of. Uh, I'm really gonna hopefully take away that mindfulness stuff that you've been talking about. And give that a serious go and, yeah. and not be too worried if it doesn't all come at once sort of thing. I'm, uh, I'm sure it will. Yeah, that's my takeaway. Thank you. How, Johnny, how about you? Uh, you've, you've inspired me to, to try golf. Yes. Can because, I get you on a course, mate? Not a problem. It, no, sir. Yeah, because my dad is a massive golfer and he's tried to get me into it. And um, But listening to you 
Do you know what it was when you said about that ball? Yeah. The the golf ball being like, you know, you, you hit it and like, there's this release. Have that. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna, I want to try that like now. So I'm going to take up golf. I think your storytelling, like the way that you were able to go back and I was with you that whole way um, when you were talking today, you know, going back and reliving everything. I was reliving everything with you and I guess, yeah, just I feel I feel very fortunate and grateful and inspired by by that and I want to sort of bring that into my own talks and again that resilience I do talk about the past and but the the way that you've done it the level of detail the because when I when I talk about the past sometimes I can you know maybe get too emotionally sort of attached and go into deep and it really affects me but the way you were talking today I don't know it inspired me to think about my own storytelling when I go into schools and when I go into different places and how I can do it better. And I was with you the, the whole way when you obviously talking about going into the sea and then, yeah. you know, going back to your wife. And I think actually that moment when you said you, you talked about it with your wife has really, again, inspired me because I've never been able to sit down with my parents and yeah. talk about like, you know, suicide and, and, and that thing on the bridge. We, we don't, we can't, we can't talk about it, but you having that courage to go to your wife and say, you know, this is what I've done and working together and like, you know, being a team, the way that she supported you kind of has inspired me maybe to be more open in my relationships because if you can do it, then I can. 100%, mate. 100%. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure and absolute honour to have you both here. So thank you so much. And for anyone who's listening who's been affected by any of the subjects that we've spoken about today, there's going to be a number of helpline numbers for you to contact on our website. But once again, a massive thank you, Johnny Benjamin and Stuart Harris. Oh, thanks, thank Alex. You. Thanks. Thank you.